Amen. We thank the Lord for being here again. Another opportunity to learn more of his word, giving on to God, thanking him for another day he has made, uh, thanking him for his mercy, thanking him for his grace, his strength. Um, I thank him for you all and I give you all honor today. I want to speak to you today concerning our Sabbath rest and what that means to us. Uh, many say that it's about a day. Um, but I submit to you that that day was a foreshadowing of the Son of God, that man, Christ Jesus. He is our rest. I want to begin in Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11 and at verse number 28. And we see that the Lord says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Verse 28 said, Come unto me, all ye that labor, that's work. Then it says, And are heavy laden, that's weighed down, and I will give you rest. And then in verse 29, he said, Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is always an instrument that binds you to another for the purpose of work. So Jesus in verse 28 is saying, come unto me, all ye that labor, all you that work, but are weighed down. So we're going to look in the scriptures today and see what that work is that would have us weighed down. And then verse 29, he tells us to take his yoke upon ourselves. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So you're going to do some work because you're putting a yoke on. You're yoking yourself up with Jesus Christ. He's going to teach us and we're going to learn of him. Then he says, for I'm meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So he's talking about rest now, even though we're going to be in a yoke with him. Then verse 30, look what he says. Remember verse 28 said that they were heavy laden, the ones he's calling, even today, those that don't know him, he's calling. You're weighed down with sin. You get, you're in your dead works of sin. That's the labor that we do before we come to Christ. But after we come to Christ, we're going to have good works. And so in verse 30, he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So once you come to Christ, you go from verse 28 being heavy laden to now in verse 30, once you come to him, your burden is light. It's not heavy anymore. The scripture even tells us that the way of the transgressor is hard. But I want to go back and look in Genesis chapter 3. Well, look in the scriptures and get an understanding of what our rest is. And we know that God created the heaven and earth in six days and on the seventh day he rested. And I submit to you that that's a foreshadowing of us working in our sins. Now, the Lord's work was holy. He's holy. Everything he did was right. Everything he did was holy and righteous. But then man comes along. And we look in Genesis chapter 2, and at verse number 7. Genesis 2 and 7. Here's the man that God made. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So this garden that God planted, the garden of Eden, he put the man in that garden. Verse number nine, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10 talks about the river that went out of Eden. Verse 11, it gives the name of the, the river. The, and then uh, verse 12, more description. Then verse 13, the second river that comes out of the Garden of Eden. Then verse uh, 14, there's a third river. Now verse 15. 
And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That's the work that that man is supposed to do. So we are all by God given nature going to work one way or another. But the question is, who are you working for? In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. You're not working for me. You're doing a work that you need to stop doing. And that work has you weighed down. You are heavy laden. Come over here. Come unto me, Jesus is saying. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. You're going to work over here too with me, Jesus is saying. But my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And in me, even though you are doing the works that are uh, under my guidance, that you learn of me, those works will be done in righteousness. And even though you're working, you'll be at rest. So in Genesis 2 and at verse number 15, it says, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Then, of course, he gives the man the commandment in verse 16, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What happens? In Genesis chapter 3, we know what happened. They ate of the fruit of the tree. They disobeyed garden, God. Uh, and while they were in the garden, they disobeyed God and ate of the fruit of that tree and thereby sin passed upon all mankind. Now, with that same God-given nature to work, you're going to do some kind of work. Adam goes from what would be righteous, godly works to now being in sin and that there would be ungodly works. We see it. Uh, he knew his wife Eve and she bare Cain. And then he knew his wife again and she bare Abel. And Cain killed Abel. That's an unrighteous work right there. And the Lord Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight is telling us to come unto him. All you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. People who say that it's about a day, Saturday, the seventh day that we're not to do any physical labor. There are those that won't cut their grass on, they won't do any physical labor on a Saturday. We can't condemn them. There's nothing wrong with actually taking a day of rest. But a person who will get out and trim his hedges, or a woman who will get out and maybe pull some weeds out of her garden on a Saturday, she's not in sin. And I'm gonna show you today. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Remember, we started in Matthew chapter 11 and look at what happens immediately. We looked at Matthew 11 verses 28, 29, and 30 and then look at Matthew chapter 12 immediately after saying that look at what Jesus shows concerning the Sabbath or concerning rest. Matthew chapter 12 and at verse number 1. It says, at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. They're walking through fields of corn and it's on the Sabbath day. The law was that if you were going to have food gathered to eat on the Sabbath day, which was the seventh day, the day you're supposed to rest on that previous day, which is the sixth day, which would be a Friday, you would gather double the amount. You'd gather enough for Friday and Saturday, and you do it all on Friday, the sixth day. That way, when you go into the seventh day or the Sabbath day, you could keep your rest and not go and pluck corn or get anything out of the fields or do any work to gather food. You did the work on Friday, and all you can do now, all you have to do now on Saturday, the seventh day, the Sabbath, is to just eat the food, but you didn't do any work to gather the food. Look at what happens here in Matthew chapter 12, verse number one. It says, at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were and hungered. They were hungry. His disciples are hungry. And this is on the Sabbath day, y'all. They walking through a cornfield. It says, and began, they hungry and they began to pluck 
There's your work. The ears of corn and to eat. That corn, according to the law, should have been gathered on Friday, the sixth day. And then there would have been no problem with eating it because you didn't have to pluck it. You'd already, on the seventh day, it wouldn't have been no problem with eating it because you already plucked it on the sixth day. But here it is on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, and they are with Jesus. The one who the law has, is pointing to. The Bible says that the law was our schoolmaster bringing us to Christ. It was pointing to Christ all along. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, go search the scriptures. Remember the Pharisees, they are the doctors of the law. They were students of the law and the prophets. And you had to be studied up 18 years before you would be qualified to try to tell anybody anything. This is why in the scriptures, just a side note, that from the age of 12 to the age of 30, which is exactly 18 years, we don't hear anything about Jesus. Until Jesus appeared at the baptism of John, we hear nothing about him, know nothing about what he was doing from the age of 12 when he was left behind in the temple and his parents had went a day's journey or so and realized Jesus wasn't there. And they went back to, and, and his mother said, what are you doing? You, you, basically, you had us worried. And Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. He was 12 years old then. We hear no more until the age of 30. That's exactly 18 years. Now he, he comes and he's able to teach and guide and lead all men, those of us, us that will receive him. Just a little side note on that. But these Pharisees, at least 18 years, they have studied the law from the age of 12 to 30 before they could tell anybody anything. So uh, 18 years of study, you're going to be well versed. You're going to be well versed in it. But without the spirit of the living God, you can't know God. Without the spirit of the living God, you can't recognize Jesus Christ. You can't recognize the savior of the world. Wonderful savior. So the Pharisees see this. Look at verse number two. The disciples in verse one got hungry, walked through the fields of corn, they began to pluck the corn and to eat. Look at verse two. But when the Pharisees saw it, now they knew that if you're gonna do some eating on the Sabbath day, you better have did the work to get that food on the sixth day, that Friday before the Sabbath, because on the Sabbath you are to rest and do no work at all. So they see this in verse two. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, they tell Jesus now, behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Your disciples are violating the law. But they with Jesus Christ, the one the law is pointing to. Look at what Jesus says. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Hmm? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Jesus is showing them that there is something greater than the law that you've been studying for at least 18 years. Hmm? You got to come to Christ now. So when we look at the Sabbath rest in the scriptures as being one day, it was. But Jesus now is our Sabbath rest. And what do we rest from? We're not resting from six days of work anymore. What we're resting from are our dead works of sin. That's what we're resting for. For, for. for some of us, we may have been in our sins for five years before we got saved, knowing that we should give our life to the Lord, heard the voice of the Lord, hardened our hearts. Five years later, we gave our life to the Lord. Some of us may have gone on till we were in our 30s or 40s. But either way it go, the Lord has called us to 
come unto him. All of us that are laboring and heavy laden, that's in those dead works of sin that will have you weighed down. We see it when Jesus calls Lazarus to come forth. He told them to remove the stone. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. The Bible said he came forth bound with grave clothes. And then the scripture said that Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. What is that a picture of? That's a picture of what we're bound by. The things that have us weighed down, whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever. We don't wait to get ourselves together. I've heard people say, well, man, I'm going to stop this drinking and smoking. Then I'm going to give my life to the Lord. You can't do it. You're putting a cart before the horse. You come to the Lord Jesus with your drinking and your smoking and your adultery and your fornication and your homosexuality. You come to him and he makes you free. Ye shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Wonderful Savior. That's how it works. Let's look at it. St. John chapter 11. We're going to come back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. St. John chapter 11. I want to look at Lazarus here. A picture of how the Lord will, when we come unto him, how he'll give us rest. St. John chapter 11. It's a spiritual principle. Spiritual principles all through the scripture where we can learn by. St. John chapter 11 and at uh, verse 33. St. John 11 and 33. Scripture reads, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, this is Mary, saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. That brings to mind Hebrews chapter four, when the Bible says that we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted in like manner as we are. You can go to Jesus Christ, no matter what your trouble or your situation is, he understands why, because he came in the flesh. And he was tempted in all points in like manner. He felt their grief right here. Verse number 34. And say it. Jesus said, where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. He wouldn't put on no fake tears. He genuinely felt their grief. And he genuinely feels for us. And he will help us in our weaknesses, in our times of need, in our time of trouble. The Bible said that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. There's something behind that. The righteous run into it and are safe. You got a lot of people that are not righteous. They won't live what they know of the word of God. They have not repented of their sins repent of their sins mean have a change of mind and I turn from my sins I do what Jesus say I come unto him all ye that labor and are heavy laden he gives me rest he delivers me there's a lot of people that won't live what they know but they call on Jesus in a time of need but Jesus said when I call on you to be holy you won't do it the scripture says the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it and are safe. Wonderful Savior. It's important that we live for the Lord. That's why loving him is so important. I uh, had a Bible study yesterday, and in the Bible study, it's something that we oftentimes have said, and we always end up coming to a conclusion of this truth, that when it comes to Jesus Christ, he's Lord and Savior, but many people just want the Savior, they don't want the Lord. They want to treat Jesus as if he's some kind of buffet. I have a big heap and helping of the Savior. Save me from the wrath of God. Give me eternal life. But when he says, submit to me as your Lord, we want to leave that on the buffet. We don't want to put that on our plates. Wonderful Savior. Something to think about. 
If you're like that today, I suggest you repent and change of it because you cannot divide Jesus. He is not going to be your savior if he's not your Lord. If he's going to be your Lord, he is automatically going to be your savior. But there's no way you're going to have one without the other. Wonderful savior. It's a package deal. <laughs> Glory to God. Verse 35 said, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus has all power. There's not a situation that's too great for him. But us in our natural thought process, and I can see them here. I mean, if he could do what he'd been doing, opening the eyes of the blind, well, couldn't he have healed this man that he would not have died? But what the Lord is doing here is showing forth the glory of God. He's not just a healer. Oh, he's a resurrector. Huh? He, not, he, 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 don't, he don't have to get to you before you die. Hmm? He can come to you after you die, after you have died and resurrect you. And that's what we're all looking forward to, isn't it? Is it not? To die in the Lord and then be risen with the resurrection unto life. If you don't believe that, you have no hope. Jesus said, believe on me as the scripture has said. Wonderful Savior. Look at verse number 37. They ask this question. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, coming to the grave, it was a cave and a stone lay up on it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this stone here in just a second. Verse 39, Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. He's been dead four days. He's already decomposing. Martha's almost saying it's too late. But it's never too late. If the Lord Jesus come to save you, you can be saved. It doesn't matter how low in the gutter you have been. It doesn't matter where you at. If you can submit to the will of God, you can be saved. It don't matter if you crack addicted, uh, fentanyl addicted, alcohol, homosexual, whatever. It does not matter. It don't matter what it is. The devil is stronger than any of us, but the Lord is stronger than him. That's why when we cry out to the Lord, save me, he makes us free from the grasps of the enemy and makes us free from sin. Wonderful Savior. But he said in verse 39, Jesus said, take ye away the stone. What is that telling us today? It's the stony heart. The Lord said, the day you hear my voice, Hebrews chapter three and four, the day you hear my voice, harden not your hearts. Take away the stone. Soften your heart toward God. Come broken before God and he'll save you. Take away the stone if you want to be delivered. I'm going to put down cigarettes. I'm going to put down alcohol. Then I'm going to give my life to the Lord. You don't have the power. And even if there are those who have been able to quit cold turkey, but you ain't able to save your soul, so you're still hell bound. You need Jesus in order to have eternal life. St. John chapter 17 and at verse number three said, and this is life eternal. Jesus is praying to God the Father. He's saying, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. You can't have eternal life without Jesus Christ, and you can quit drinking, smoking, running women, chasing men, uh, uh, homosexual activity. You can quit lying, you can quit robbing, stealing. But if you have not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you still don't have eternal life. Wonderful Savior. The Lord came to save, not just to deliver. That's up. That's the, see. That's it right there. People want the salvation. Save me from this. Save me from that. I want to leave this alone. I want to leave that alone. But the Lord said, "Humble yourself to me. 
humble yourself under my mighty hand. Well, I don't really want to do that now. I, I mean, I, I still want to have my way song. Wonderful Savior. Jesus said in verse number 39, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus is not moved by how bad the situation is. You call him out of there and he'll come out of there smelling like roses. huh? Anybody that the Lord has saved and you look at them today and then look at how they were, you'd be like, I, I can't even tell you went through what you went through. I can't even tell that you used to be this or used to be that. The Lord is a restorer. Wonderful. Say, so it don't matter how bad it was, he will restore you. But you must submit to his lordship. He's not a buffet. We don't get to pick and choose what we want. We go to Golden Corral and different places and you get to pick and choose what you want. And that's all right in the natural. But when it comes to the word of God, you got to eat the whole roll. You got to have all of it. Wonderful Savior. Verse number 40. She said, he's been dead four days. Verse number 40, Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it. The Lord is always trying to build our faith. Wonderful Savior. That they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound, hand and foot. Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You, you weigh down. This got a grip on you. It's wearing you down. I said I was going to stop, but I can't stop. Hmm? He said, come to me. But when you come, you come for more than just getting the weight off you. Being free of this thing that, uh, that it may be an addiction in your life or whatever the case may be. You come in to submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and live for him and to his glory and to his honor for the rest of your days. That's why you come. And it's because you love him. That's why the gospel must be preached. When the gospel is preached about what Jesus Christ did for us while we were yet dead in our trespasses and sin, how he loved us. The Bible said we love him because he first loved us. When you hear the gospel preached, you can understand the love that God showed us through his son, Jesus Christ. And you can say, Lord, have mercy. I can't help but love this man. I can't help but submit myself to him. Wonderful Savior. Can't help but love them. We don't do it out of fear. We don't do it because we don't want to go to hell. But the Bible said God has not given us the spirit of fear. You see, he doesn't give us the spirit of fear. So our service to him is not out of fear because I don't want to go to hell. When you truly love the Lord Jesus Christ, you will serve him even if you found out there was no hell. That's real love. Wonderful Savior. It's a free will thing. It's a choice to make that you make. It's not cause uh, something might happen to me. It's not about me, it's about him. When I love him, it's all about him. I just want him to be pleased. I want him to be glorified. I want him to be lifted up. Wonderful savior, oh glory. Verse number 42. He says, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus has spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Look at verse 44. And he that was dead came forth. You cannot come forth until you remove the stone. You got to you got to let go and forsake that hard heart. If you have a hard heart today. That way you can come forth. You see the principle here? The stone has been removed. Now he come forth, but he come forth bound. 
What are you bound by today? If you're bound by anything. Alcohol, drugs, women, men, money, hmm? prosperity. You see, when the gospel is preached, you can see the love of God and you can love them back. But what if prosperity is preached to you? You can't see the love of God because the love of God is not prosperity. Ask that other man named Lazarus that was laid at a rich man's gate with a body full of sores. He was a beggar. But when he died, he was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. So if the love of God was prosperity, then we wouldn't have had a beggar man. We wouldn't have any beggars because God so loved the world. Everybody in the world would be well off if the love of God was prosperity. See the error of our way today? Preaching prosperity and blessing plans. When you do that, you can't, you're not preaching the love of God. And how can the, we then expect people to love him? The Bible said we love him because he first loved us. But if from the jump, we're not preaching his love. But I tell you, this is a counterfeit love. And wherever the Lord lead, I come here to talk about the Sabbath. But we're going to let the Lord have his way today. When we talk about the love of God, there's a message on this channel that's called God's Love Understood. If you go up under the videos and, and go back a ways, there's a message called God's Love Understood where I deal with this issue about how we have defined God, God's love like we define man's love. And they are not the same. Man's love is always gonna be beneficial to the flesh. It's gonna make you feel good. God's love will chastise you. God's love will shine a light on where you lack something. God's love will, will show you where you need to come up. God's love will step on your toes. God's love is the true love. It's the one that we, when we see it, if we don't harden our hearts, we can love him back. And Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Look at verse 44, Jesus in verse 43 cried with a loud voice saying, Lazarus, come forth. Verse 44 says, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes. What are my grave clothes? My grave clothes, I was running around in the street. I was drinking a little bit, smoking a little bit, doing a little bit, dibbling, dabbling, this, that, and other. Those were grave clothes. In other words, I was ready to die. I was dressed for death because if the Lord Jesus had called me home and say time is up, I'd have lift up my eyes and hell. Why? Because I wouldn't dress properly. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you enter into a dressing room and you take off all the things that you were doing before you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, those grave clothes, and you now put on a garment that is dictated to us out of the scriptures as to how we ought to live, how we ought to walk, how we ought to talk, how we ought to think. We put on those, that wedding garment. So you go from being dressed for death, come to Jesus Christ, and now you're dressed for a wedding. You're dressed to be his bride. You talking about two polar opposites? It's like a wedding and a, the difference between a wedding and a funeral. Polar opposite. Family come together on both of them. But one of them is joy. And if there are some tears, they're tears of joy. On the other one is sadness. But there is a little bit of joy in the other one. And naturally speaking, if we know that that family member died in the Lord, because we all got to die. But if they died and they weren't in the Lord, I mean, where's the joy? Where's the hope? All we can do is reflect on ourselves and say, I want to make sure I'm right when I leave here. Wonderful Savior. Verse number 44, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes. See, this is what the Lord wants to get us rest from. These are the things that have us weighed down. These are the things that, that I can't let go of myself. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes. Then it said, and his face was bound about with a napkin. You're blind and you can't see. 
we think we can see. When we were in our sins, we thought that we knew what we were doing. But it was until we came to the Lord Jesus Christ that we realized that we were poor and miserable and blind and naked and thought we had it going on. We see it today, those of us that are saved, we look around us today and we can see the pride in people and the way people go about doing things and we can see how we used to be like that. And we can see how foolish we were when we look at others that don't know the Lord today. That's why it's so important that we live where we know that our light will shine before them and they'll see our good works and maybe they'll come to a place where they'll glorify our Father which is in heaven. Verse number 44, see if I can get through it. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin. Look what Jesus says. See, he came bound. The stone was removed. He came at the call of Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He came. And what happened? The Lord took care of the rest. All he had to do was come. The, the, the stone is removed. He came and the Lord going to make him free. See, it said and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them. He didn't say anything to Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. That was the end of the discussion with Lazarus. And it wasn't even discussion. It was just a directive, a command, come forth. Hmm? Now we got free will whether we come or not. Lazarus came forth. Now, when he comes forth, he's bound, grave clothes. Then he's got this napkin about his face. Hmm? And his face is bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, to the grave clothes and the napkin that's around his face, loose him and let him go. There goes your adultery, fornication, your, your alcoholism, everything that's got you dressed for the grave, dressed for death. He said, loose him and let him go. Wonderful Savior. Verse 45 says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Wonderful Savior. Back to Matthew chapter 11, verse number 12. We're talking about Sabbath rest today, but you can't get no rest if you don't soften your heart with a stony heart. And here's the thing about hearing the word of God and resisting it, hardening your heart. Every time your heart gets more calloused, it gets harder and harder and harder. The more you resist the word of God, the more easily it becomes for you to resist the word of God and you basically bury yourself alive behind your own stony heart because you won't remove the stone. Wonderful Savior. This is needed today. I'm encouraging anyone that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ to give your life to him before it's too late. We're living in the last days. We see all this stuff that's going on today. We got all kind of nonsense today. We got transgenderism, men being with men, women being with women, uh, uh, gender fluidity and all this. The Lord said in the beginning, he made them male and female. That's Matthew 19. And that's it. And I may do a, uh, the Lord lead me to do a lesson on, on, on how we're born. You know, people said we're born this way. Yeah, we're all born wrong and we all need to be born again. So I don't argue about a person who said they were born feeling like a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa. I don't argue that point. I get to the main point, which is you must be born again. And when you're born again, the Lord rectifies all that. If you were born a man and you feel like you were born a woman inside of a man body, God, the Lord Jesus will fix it when you're born again. You'll be a man's man. Or vice versa. If you were female and you felt like you felt like you was a, a man trapped in a female's body, you come and be born again. I mean, you tell me I was born this way, but be born again. He told Nicodemus in St. John chapter 3, you must be born again. If you want to inherit the kingdom of God. If you want to have eternal life, you must be born again. So when you're born again, the Lord will, will make, uh, uh, make you a, a lady's lady. Feminine is all outdoors. Feminine is all, I mean, just as feminine as a summer breeze. 
wonderful Savior. The Lord will make you right now. He ain't making any mistakes. But the thing is, we are born in a fallen state and he comes to lift us up. So we can't say that the fallen state that Adam caused us to be in in the first place. We started back there with Adam. How they sin in Genesis chapter 3. Now everything is born broken and must be fixed. And there's no telling what you're going to get. The way we're born is not the will of God. The will of God was that man did not touch that tree. That was the will of God. But he gave us free will, and this the, we are now living the consequences of man's free will. And today, we can't blame Adam because we have choices today our own, and we can turn to the Lord Jesus today if we want to, those of us who haven't. But will you? Can't blame Adam. You can be born again. Wonderful Savior. Matthew chapter 12, remember the disciples that uh, walking through the fields of corn. But you notice here in Matthew 12 that it said his disciples were hungry and began to pluck corn, but Jesus didn't. See, the law had to be fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled the law. That's why he's not plucking corn, but his disciples were. So what is Jesus showing us? He's in, in one instance here in Matthew chapter 12, he's showing that he's taking care of what we could not do before to satisfy God and he's now making us free from many of the the um, requirements of the law to now walk in the spirit of the law after him going forward this is why it's not about a day it's about a life lived the Sabbath rest is now about a life lived in Jesus Christ free from the dead works of sin that's the rest he's talking about in Matthew 11 and 28. Wonderful Savior. Matthew chapter 12. You know, they had said, um, you know, your disciples doing that which is unlawful. And he says in verse 5, he talked about uh, the priests and he talked about, he talked in verse 5, he talk, talked about David, how he did that which was unlawful. And pro, uh, breaking the Sabbath in verse 4. Verse, uh, verse 3, verse 4, uh, goes on to talk about David verse 5 or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless but look what he said but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple but if ye had known what this meaneth he said I will have mercy and not sacrifice he would not have condemned the guiltless. I believe it's in Hosea where uh, that scripture is, Jesus is quoting out of Hosea when he says, um, if you had known what this meaning, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. The Lord Jesus Christ is the mercy of God. He's coming to have mercy on us for uh, 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 the redemption of us, and the forgiveness of our sins by what he's going to do. Not the sacrifices that we make. See, the sacrifices can, cannot save us. The keeping of the law cannot save us. Observing a Sabbath day cannot save us. All that is outward. The Lord Jesus comes to deal with the heart of the matter. He comes to deal with the heart. Wonderful Savior. Then he goes on, he says in verse 7, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. He said, they're, they're, they're guiltless. He said, my disciples are guiltless. This is Jesus. Why can't we just believe Jesus? They plucking corn in the fields on the Sabbath day. The doctors of theology come and point it out. So your disciples are doing that which is unlawful to be done on the Sabbath day. And Jesus tells them that they are condemning the guiltless. Why are they guiltless now? Because the one that the law was pointing to, the one that the Sabbath was foreshadowing, is here now. And look what he says in verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So Jesus is greater than the Sabbath day. So who do we observe? Do we observe a day or do we observe Jesus? Wonderful Savior. Glory to God.
There's another scripture I think I want to go to here concerning this Sabbath. Oh, the, 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 the works. Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Show you the works we're ceasing from. Galatians chapter 5. And uh, <clears throat> we'll start at verse 16. We're looking at uh, what are we resting from? Under the old covenant, they were resting from six days of work. And then the seventh day was a day of rest. If you want to eat, need to get something out the field, you got double out of the field on Friday, the sixth day, so that you could eat on the seventh day without doing any work. Now, Jesus comes and shows us clearly in Matthew chapter 12 that they were guiltless doing work on the Sabbath day. Said he told the Pharisees, you condemning the guiltless. If you had understanding of this, you wouldn't be condemning the guiltless. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath day. That's what Jesus said, wonderful savior. So what works are there now that we cease from, even though I told you earlier, we do do continue to do works, it's just not the dead works of sin. Lord willing, we'll go to Ephesians chapter two and, uh, and close out uh, finishing up the point. Uh, Galatians chapter five and verse number 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Your flesh is contrary to God. My flesh is contrary to God. But by the spirit of the living God, I keep my flesh in check. So whatever my flesh would want to do, I can't do it not in keep loving Jesus Christ. And I choose Jesus Christ over my flesh or myself every day. This is why Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Jesus didn't have to name off every sin that you could think of. He took care of it all when he said, deny yourself. If you deny yourself, you can live right. But you cannot deny yourself without the power of God. You got to come to Jesus. You got to come to Jesus to be made free from this, this flesh. Paul shows it in Romans chapter 7. Where he said, when I went to do good, evil was always present. Then he asked towards the end around verse number 24, who's going to deliver me? Then he said, I thank God that through Jesus Christ, with my mind, I can serve the law of God. And with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. So now there's a choice. And he goes on in verse chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who walk not, who walk after the spirit, walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So when Jesus comes, you now have a choice. But before Jesus, you don't have a choice. You're going to do exactly what your flesh want to do. You might stop for a little bit, but you'll go right back to it. Wonderful Savior. And we see the same thing here in verse 16, Galatians 5 and 16, saying the same thing. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you're going to do work. Will those works be according to the flesh? Or will those works be according to the spirit? Remember, God put it in man to work. Before Adam sinned, in Genesis chapter 3, he sinned. In Genesis 2, he's holy. He's in the image of God. And God still had work for him to do. Put him in the garden to tend the garden. So it's not that we are supposed to stop working on a, a particular day. That's not what it's about now. It's about now a spiritual walk where I have ceased from all my dead works of sin and I am now working, doing the works of righteousness according to the Spirit of God. James even said, faith without works is dead. Galatians 5 and 17 said, for the love 
flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Then he says, verse 19, now the works, here are the works that Jesus is calling us. Matthew 11, 28, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He's calling us to rest from these works right here. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery. Come, come unto me, Jesus said. Come, come out to adultery. I, I know you can't help yourself. But I got power over it. Remove the stony heart and come to me. And I'll speak to that adulterous spirit in you. And I'll cast it out. Wonderful Savior. Loose him and let him go. That's what the Lord Jesus will say. If you'll just remove the stony heart and come to him. You'll cease your dead works of sin. And you'll be resting in the Lord of the Sabbath for the rest of your days. He will. You'll be remembering the Sabbath day and keeping it holy in Jesus Christ. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, then he said, and such like. I mean, the list, you, you, you need a tablet on top of tablet to name off every sin. But he said, and such like. Everything that goes along with wickedness, that goes along with the flesh, everything that's against the will of God. He said, the Lord said, come unto me. You're, la you're laboring. It's dead works of sin. It's got you weighed down. You got to tell one lie to cover another lie. Your husband or your wife asks you where you been and you know you ain't did right now. You got to lie about it. Huh? But I thought you said that. Uh, another lie. I tried to call you. Well, my, my battery was dead on my phone. All those things. It's got you. You got to stay on your toes to keep your lie propped up. The Lord said, I'll deliver you. I'll give you rest from all of that. You don't have a problem with your wife or your husband picking up your phone. They'll know the passcode to your phone and be able to look in your phone, no problem. Instead of you getting nervous when they reach for your phone. Huh? See, see how you weighed, you'd be weighed down with that nonsense? The Lord said, I'll give you rest. Wonderful Savior. Verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. Look what the Lord say. That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But look, when you come to Jesus, what happened? You be filled with the spirit of the living God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, all this is in your Sabbath rest. Peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. Verse 24, and they that are Christ, those that belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. I kill it off in me. By the power of God. Every time it try to rise up in my flesh, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I look to the Lord Jesus and he strengthens me. Wonderful Savior. We have what it takes in Jesus. Can't do it on your own. That's why Lazarus had to come forth bound. He can't do it on his own. He had to come to the one that could speak to the grave clothes and say, loose him and let him go. Verse 25 says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Wonderful Savior, let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another or envying one another. Ephesians chapter 2, Lord willing, will be done. Talking about that Sabbath rest is in Jesus Christ now. It's not about a day. 
But if somebody wants to observe a day, we, we, we don't condemn them. But use this on the flip side, that those that observe the day, they'll say that we who have understanding that it's not about a day anymore, it's about now resting from the dead works of sin, living a life in subjection to Jesus Christ, they usually judge us and say that we're in sin because we cut our grass on Saturday. It's all about understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But with all thy getting, get understanding. Ephesians chapter 2 and at verse number 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works. There is no good work that we could do to make us saved. But James said, faith without works is dead. So a living faith, a real faith, will produce good works. I quoted it already. Let your light so shine before men. Jesus said this. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus said, let them see your good works. It's not the works that save you, but if you are a child of God, you will have good works. It comes with the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. It's a byproduct of it. Salvation comes by grace through faith. That's it. But once you are saved and continuing in the faith, you will have good works that are indicative of a true and a living faith in Jesus Christ. That's how it works. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is gift, gift of God. Verse 9 said, not of works, lest any man should boast. And you could pat yourself on the back for your salvation if you could work for it. Verse 10 goes on to say, for we are his workmanship. See, he's doing the work through us. And if the Lord is in us doing the work through us, then it ought to be some work done. You yoke yourself up with Jesus Christ. You're no longer weighed down. You're no longer heavy burden, heavy laden. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's after you come to Christ. But before he said, you let your weigh down, remove the stone, whatever your name is, come forth. Whatever your name is, you come forth bound. You come forth with that that you can't handle. Wonderful savior that's got you weighed down. And you enter into your Sabbath rest, who is Jesus the Christ. Wonderful Savior, the Son of the living God. Verse number 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, meaning for or to do good works. We're created to do good works. So it's not that we're not working, it's the work that we do. Is it of the flesh? Or is it of the spirit? Jesus is calling us out of our fleshly works to rest from those dead works of sin and come in him and, and work according to the spirit of the living God, where it's not hard. Like I said, according to the flesh, it's hard. You got to remember the lie you told. Well, that's such a relief coming in Jesus Christ. I ain't got to remember the lie you told. And then remember to tell the lie the same way. Mm. That's too much trouble. Wonderful Savior. <laughs> I want to relax, man. Yeah, in Jesus, I can relax. Wonderful Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus. One last scripture the Lord laid on my heart. Wonderful Savior, find it here. It is going to be Philippians. Chapter 2. Wonderful Savior. Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verse number 12. Philippians 2 and 12. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He said, work it out. 
But look what it goes on, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So it's the Lord working in us, and we work that out. That's the work we do now in Jesus Christ. That's the work that we do while we are in our Sabbath rest all the way until we take our last breath. That's the end of the lesson today. God bless you. I hope it was a blessing to you, and I hope that we got understanding today about the Sabbath rest. God is good to us. I love learning of them. I love the scriptures. Um, and uh, I thank God for you all. And God bless you all. We're going to close with prayer. Lord, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for the understanding that you have given us, Father. Uh, all this is done to your glory, Father, to your honor. Lord, you get all the praise. Lord, I ask that you bless everybody that is tuned in, that watches this video, and that it bring glory to your name and understanding to the minds and the hearts of men that people will be saved, Father, and ultimately you will be glorified. It is my prayer that everything that is done from this day forward, Lord, is done to your glory and to your honor. And Father, you get all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. And amen. God bless you and keep the faith.